Friedrich Nietzsche, a man who suffered greatly from bodily ills, considered himself somewhat of a physician. Yet his remedies were not aimed towards physical conditions of the body, but rather the personal and societal ills of his time. Nietzsche, often poetically and rhetorically, dissected what he perceived to be the root of the suffering or apathy many of his contemporaries were facing. His diagnosis focused primarily on the human tendency to deny life. Life denying, for Nietzsche, came in many ways. The asceticism of the Buddha or Arthur Schopenhauer, the herd-like mentality of what Nietzsche called the last man, and most famously, the otherworldly illusions of Christianity. To him, these were all attempts to cower in the face of an objectively indifferent reality. Nietzsche's prognosis? To stand in the face of this indifference and to shout yes, to affirm life and strive for personal excellence. How he envisions this is subject to much scholarly debate, but Nietzsche provides certain clear themes over his prolific authorship. His masterwork, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, suggests that we should look forward to the Ubermensch or Superman, a spiritually healthier individual who approaches the world in an honest and fearless way. Similarly, continuing his claim from the gay science, Thus Spoke Zarathustra also reminds the reader that God is dead. Nietzsche wanted people to recognize the void and values left by God's absence and the responsibility we have been given to create our own meaning. Nietzsche's legacy is an interesting one. Thus spoke Zarathustra, along with the Bible ironically, were given to German soldiers during the First World War. He also, after his death, was accused of being a proto-Nazi due to his sister's influence over his final posthumous works. You need to take a breath. <laughs> <laughs> Andy. Don't forget to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nietzsche's thoughts on his own works are remarkable in their irony and grandiosity. He hoped his messages would strike a chord with people and force them to look deep into their own intentions and actions. He also hoped that they would provide a basis for personal change. A passage from Ecce Homo gives us an insight into his style and desired effect. I know my fate. One day my name will be associated with the memory of something tremendous. A crisis without equal on earth, the most profound collision of conscience, a decision that was conjured up against everything that had been believed, demanded, hallowed so far. I am no man. I am dynamite. Hello, I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined once... Is that what I said? Hello and welcome to the Pants Sidecast. I'm Jack Symes. Hello and welcome to the Pants... Is that what I say? <laughs> yeah, do you, yes, I've never you really that. thought about it, but it sounds right. It's yeah. taken me... I just stumbled there. I'm not sure... I, do I say welcome to the Pants Sidecast or just say hello, hello I'm Jack Symes? Welcome to the Pants Sidecast. Yeah, I think I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined by... Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that sounds right. Rather than, hello, I'm Jack Symes, welcome to the Pants Sidecast. I'm oh, I say the by. episode. I remember. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to episode 53 of the Pan Psycast. I'm Jack Symes and I'm going to give you both a little introduction here. Full-time canteen and part-time hunk, this five foot nine hyper man knows his way up a mountain. As well as fishing, kite flying and playing flute, this prototypical dreamy Nietzschean, he also enjoys squashing the intermention and bashing those who do not embrace the death of God. Yes, you guessed it. It's the overman, the nobleman, the superman. Mr. Andrew Horton. That is the most impressive introduction <laughs> I've ever been given. Factually in inaccurate, but <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Part-time hillbilly and full-time virtue ethicist, <laughs> this cowardly beast spends his time following slave morality. As well as tightrope walking, reading the second sex and performing the Eucharist, he also enjoys burying his head in the sand and failing to fulfill his potential. It's the underman, the untermension, the camel. It's Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jack. No, if, if anything, I think it undersells me, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I've written these things down. But yeah, how long did that take? You spent a lot. Not as long as this. Merry Christmas! Ha ha ha! I laugh and dance. Have you not heard the news? I have been in solitude for too long and grown a great beard. <laughs> Did you not hear? God is dead. God has died in his pity for the pan cast. Jesus is dead. The Christian squirms and denies. Cowardice. All too human. They would have to sing better songs to make me believe in their redeemer. His disciples would have to look more redeemed. Crikey, that's very poetic of you, Jack. I didn't Ooh. realize you were such a... As all reading all this Nietzsche made you into a, a poet. 
Those, that is easily the best introduction we've ever had to the show. <laughs> so I thank you greatly for for what was a beautiful we, piece of poetry. Because you got all the compliments, I got all the negative stuff. I'm That's dynamite. true. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah you, got, you got the raw end of that. Oh, well. well, Merry Christmas to you both. Did you both have a nice Christmas? It's New Year's Eve Eve today, isn't it? Oh, that's incredible. That's really gone by quickly. Uh, what happened at Christmas? Uh, what did you do, Andrew? Uh, I dressed up as Santa for the day, and I <laughs> went to the homeless shelter nearby, and, oh, I, good. and I gave out soup. That's good of you. Well done. Um, Ollie, what did you do on Christmas Day? It's Christmas Day I spent with my family, and it was lovely. Wonderful. Many mince pies? Uh, many mince pies. Lots of food. Yes, that's what that's the true meaning of Christmas, surely, is just overindulging. That's I, I what like, Jesus said. I like your mug there. Thank you, yeah. This, uh, this is actually a present I got over Christmas. Would you like to know what it says? Um, go on. Can you read it? It says, just try to say, God is not dead. And there's a picture of Nietzsche with his wonderful mustache there. Yeah. So it's actually your mug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's your my Nietzsche mug. My dad got <laughs> me for Christmas last year. Did he? Oh, yeah, okay. 12 yeah. months. No, it's good. Uh, I feel like when I drink coffee, I just get the just the taste that God is dead. It's good. It's nice. Well, we haven't seen each other since we, or all together, since we did the Simone de Beauvoir episodes. They were really good. Some really, reflection. Really positive, really positive feedback from, from colleagues and family and friends on the Simone de Beauvoir episodes. They're really fun to record, research. Um, and I think we've got a, a bit of a calling to bring you some old school pan cast. That's kind of, uh, we really enjoyed that episode and we're going to really enjoy doing this one too. Well, we didn't get a chance to give each other pre- Should we do some Christmas gift giving? Yeah, let's let's give each other some prezzy, shall we, Andy? Sure thing. Do you want to describe and what's going on, Andy, being as we're going to yeah. be away from the microphones? So at, at the moment, Ollie has provided oh, thank you, some sort of what book-like Amazing present, game. and as has Jack. Now, well, has, has Andy got one? So has Andy got one? Got one. Well, I've, got, I've got one here. Now, in the spirit of, of, well, what is what is this? Some Chris, sort of uh, pan psychast Christmas. Pan psychast Christmas. Uh, mine. I'll do mine last, as they are unwrapped. <laughs> what? Oh, I'll just do mine first. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> hold up! Don't let him get away with that. They're unwrapped. Yeah, they're unwrapped. What? Why didn't you wrap your presents, Andy? I mean, Jack's got some lovely blue wrapping paper. I've polar, got some lovely red wrapping on paper. I like yours. This is uh, this is very cute. Yeah. So where, where's your wrapping paper, Andy? I didn't think it was in the Dionysian spirit. You know, I just. <laughs> I just went with the flow. I just picked up whatever I felt like and I th- threw it in my bag. Right, that's, that's really, yeah. You'll find out. What we got here? Wait, so these are the uh, these are one from Jack. Oh, nice. Ooh, look at this. What have we got here? Spinoza's Ethics. Ollie, how did you know? <laughs> the meaning of belief. <laughs> Religion. No, that's from an awesome. Atheist Thank you, point of view. Religion Thank you very much. By Jack. Tim Crane. Oh, this looks good. And I also mm. I like my... small books. It looks it looks really good. I've picked myself <laughs> up the copy as well to give it. Have you got yourself a copy of Ethics as well from Spinoza? I don't, but I think I might. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, have to get <laughs> I should have bought you I'm not a reading copy a book of, and not doing the ethics. Episode. No, no, true. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we have some uh, philosophical presence there, uh, which is great because this is a philosophy podcast. But uh, I've got well, at least Ollie's. Actually, this is a philosophical presence. So, oh Ollie's uh, present. And he's reaching into his bag. This is my Santa sack. <laughs> it's just his backpack. <laughs> it's just my regular bag. So, What's this? this is some oh, wow. fine fine oils there oh, for wow. yourself, Thanks Mr. Fine Marley. oils. I've got a duck butter beard oil for send gift bag. For the philosopher's beard. <laughs> nice. Beard commander, forest ranger, metro spice and cool mint. They're very uh, good. Good scents That there. looks really nice. Have I, got, have I got a gift on me? <laughs> oh, sh**. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> my gift is bleeping out your swearing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I do. Now I know you're a, an absurd hero, and uh, <laughs> the uh, and I thought, well, you you know, you're obviously a, a man of philosophy, but you like your humour as well, and uh, so I've I've decided to pick you up the book from the the greatest Twitter philosopher there is. <gasps> you have. The My Beautiful Despair oh, nice. by Kim Kierkegaard Dashiell. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Kierkegaard oh, I've got well, I've got gift nice, envy that now. Really good. That looks, we can, uh, just flick it to a random page, Jack. And just read, read us one Give of us the some wisdom. Of Come on. Yeah, we want some wisdom. My dates tonight. Mortification and solitude. <laughs> <laughs> want a red carpet look for New Year's? Clothe yourself in pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank, it's good, it's good. Here's a quick anti-aging trick. Die. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Andy. That's, That's quite really kind of you. Oh, are we? Wonderful. Are we very lucky? We we're, are. We're we're all truly blessed. And nothing says gift giving and Christmas like the death of God, does it? 
So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we said this before on the on the day that most people celebrate the birth of God, <laughs> we'll be celebrating the death. <laughs> we did this last year, didn't we? We did Nietzsche last we year. We did. We yeah, did. We did the well, lovely interview Sadler. with uh, Mark Vincent Meyer and Gregory Sadler. Um, and I think that as much as that episode is a really good interview, I think if you already know quite a bit about Nietzsche, I think one of our goals for this episode is if you've never heard of Nietzsche before. That episode, I don't necessarily think, is a good introduction. Mm. Um, so I think this one would be much more, uh, you know, if you've never heard of Nietzsche before, this is the episode you want to listen to because we're going to break down some of his key ideas and his thoughts and his moustache. So, you know, it's, there's something for everyone. Well, as we said, this is a four-part series on Nietzsche. This week in part one, we're going to be looking at Nietzsche's life. In part two, we're going to be looking at his you know, his master work, what he claims is his best work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In part three, we're going to look at his, his next book, which was Beyond Good and Evil, and in part four, Further Analysis and Discussion. So you've got loads of Nietzsche coming up. Just before you do, let's have a b- little bit more admin, if that's okay. Um, sweatshirts, we've nearly sold out. Maybe we have sold out by the time you, we're all wearing ours again today. I mean, I haven't taken mine off. I think it's uh, it's the warmest sweatshirt it's I've ever worn. It's covered in gravy. You sp- it's not a turkey. <laughs> I've washed it, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't taken it off, but you've washed it. Yeah. Well, as in, like, I've been wearing it a lot. It's very comfortable, especially when the weather gets colder. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the rain is is basically washing it, right, Jack? I just I just wear it wherever I go. It's nice. You should wash them. No. Uh, Patreon. Make sure you go to, over to Patreon and support the show. We want to keep bringing you this content. We never fail in giving you a weekly dosage of philosophy, so don't fail us, in the words of Ollie Marley. Thank you all to everyone who's supporting us on Patreon. Particularly, thank you to Jim Clare for his support. Jim Clare is one of our biggest donators on Patreon. Jim, without your support, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you kindly. We really hope you enjoy this episode on Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche. We're going to save our listeners' questions to part four this time because they're quite specific. That's absolutely fine. That works with me. That's, <laughs> yeah, what, what am I to say to that, Jack? Great idea. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Are we looking forward to Nietzsche? Are we looking forward to discussing Nietzsche's work? Yes, I think Nietzsche is a philosopher that definitely inspires a lot of interesting ideas and discussion. And he's, you know, he's somewhat connected to the existentialists because he talks a lot about the human condition um, and, you know, kind of grappling with big, big questions about uh, morality, which we're going to be discussing, God. Um, so all the stuff that we like talking about, um, that, you know, all the stuff we really, really enjoy dissecting and picking apart. I think that it will lean into our strengths as a as a, a podcast, I think. I think a lot of the things we like talking about, we're going to cover uh, in detail. So, yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. Uh, I mean, I'm coming from the position where, as last year I was unable to take part in the discussion on Nietzsche, that... I really haven't had much of a background in reading him. So I've enjoyed doing a bit of prep and, and kind of, I've, I consider myself to be a magpie of all things Nietzsche in the last couple of weeks. I've literally just dipped into everything I could. I don't think that makes me an expert in it at all, but I enjoy to throw in a bunch of quotes that I found and, and see what you think. Nice. Very nice. He's very much a blogging style, as Mark Lintzemar said in our last instalment on Nietzsche, back in episode 30. We recommend going back to that once you've listened to our full series on Nietzsche, because it really does push and challenge um, some of the more contemporary debates surrounding him. This is very much an introduction to Nietzsche's thought. So if you know loads about Nietzsche already, don't expect this from the off to be pushing on, you know, the the peaks of your knowledge. We're going to build from the ground up like we always do. We're going to work through the text carefully and with a smile on our faces. Um, We have spent a long time going through his works and looking at all the background material as well. So hold our hands, trust us, and we'll guide you up the the Nietzschean mountain. I just wanted to give you a quote from why I was so excited to do Nietzsche. A quote from Nietzsche himself. I have at all times written my writings with my whole heart and soul. I do not know what purely intellectual problems are. I think the great thing about Nietzsche is he chucks himself into philosophy with his whole heart and it's asking how should we live. So it's really in line with our other existentialist episodes. He's trying to he's trying to find a way of getting his philosophy to be lived out in the world. It's very a uh, personal and subjective philosophy. And he's very controversial, which is always a bit tasty. Mm. A lot, lot of his work written aphorisms and things like this. And he's always, when we did our audiobook and we were looking at Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who kind of reminds me of Nietzsche in a sense, but Nietzsche kind of goes the full hog. 
Bonhoeffer said that every um, great sermon needs a shot of heresy. Well, if his had a shot, then Nietzsche's just got a bucket, <laughs> <laughs> <He's> just, <laughs> bucket of heresy. Yeah. <laughs> just chucked it on there. Drowning in a trough of heresy. Yeah. And threw a match on it as well. <laughs> <laughs> Part one, the life of Nietzsche. Awesome. So we're going to give quite a brief overview of Nietzsche's life. It is a fascinating life. And he's one of those characters where the lives are just as interesting as their philosophies. Now, in anticipation for this, a new book recently came out called I Am Dynamite. And it is by Sue Prudeau, I believe I'm pronouncing her name right. And it's a great biography of Nietzsche's whole life. And I really recommend picking that up if you're interested in that discussion here. But we're going to give a whistle-stop tour the, the greatest hits of Nietzsche's life. Where does our story begin, gentlemen? Well, it begins in 1884, Jack, the classic year, my favourite year of all time. Uh, so Nietzsche was born in 1884. I thought it was um, 1844. 1844, yeah. 15th of October. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Uh, Sun, stand strong there, <laughs> Do you want to do that again? Yeah. Where does that story start? <laughs> yeah. 1884. <laughs> in 1752. Yeah, like, he died in 1900. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke. That was true. Thus spoke <laughs> Ollie. <laughs> I'm going to say, actually, you know what? I'm going to do that. Where does our story begin, Ollie? <laughs> Begins in 1844, Jack. Uh, Nietzsche was born in the town of Rocken near Leipzig in the Prussian province of Saxony. So in the modern sense, that would be Germany. Hmm. So he's named after King Frederick Wilhelm IV uh, of Prussia, who turned 49 on the day of Nietzsche's birth. So his father named him after the king. And Nietzsche later went on to drop his middle name, Wilhelm. So we'll just refer to him as Friedrich Nietzsche from here on. Or just Friedrich, really. Or just Nietzsche. Nah, that would be ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Should we yep. talk about his parents and his family? Well, I guess very early on, at the age of five, uh, he sadly experienced a great loss in his family which uh, could arguably have had quite a profound effect on his upbringing which was the loss of his father and then shortly following that he also lost uh, a brother as well so we have this this fact that he's been brought up his father was a clergy member and there was a dream that his son would one day grow up to be a, a clergy man himself mm. uh, which obviously we could say is very far from the reality in which formed and maybe the fact that after his father died and he was perhaps less inclined to follow the exact path mm. that was going to be set for him that that we, we may never have heard of Nietzsche had this event not happened. Yes, yeah. his father was a Lutheran minister, wasn't he? Yeah, so there's a very much strong religious element to his early upbringing and his early life. Obviously, with his father's death, you can definitely maybe see the start of his eventual you know, rejection of religious belief. But, I mean, he was known by a kind of a adorable somewhat nickname when he was little, wasn't he? He was known as like the little pastor because mm. he was supposed to be a really generous, selfless, really kind and giving young child, a very happy child. I think we have this perspective of Nietzsche as being this somewhat kind of depressed, <laughs> nihilistic older gent. But apparently when he was younger, he was, you know, very lovely and very sweet. Mm. Uh, this is a backtrack on his family a little bit here. So he, yes, he is one of three and he's from a Lutheran family. Bear in mind, 19th century Prussia, now Germany. It's just Catholics and Lutheran Protestants. That's the religious atmosphere of the time. And he's one of three, like we say. Elizabeth is his sister. Elizabeth, later on, who became forced to Nietzsche, and we'll speak about her in a moment. But his younger brother, Ludwig Joseph, uh, passed away, like Andrew said, when he was a child. Funny story about his sister, Elizabeth. I mean, she's going to come up quite a lot, isn't she, mm. as we go through his life here. I want to quote from uh, Sue Prado's book here. Um, Nietzsche had a natural history book growing up, she writes, in which, I'm quoting from a book, taught him that the llama was a remarkable animal. It willingly carries the heaviest burdens, but when the llama does not want to go on, it turns its head round and discharges its sliver, which has an unpleasant odour, into the rider's face. <laughs> if coerced or treated badly, it refuses to take any nourishment and lies down in the dust to die. And he felt this description fit his sister Elizabeth perfectly. So he refers to it in all his letters as, as, as Lama or Faithful Lama. And she loved this nickname. Apart from the part about her spitting, she thought this summed herself up wonderfully as well. So he refers to her as Lama throughout their lives. Siblings are wonderful, aren't they? So it's like weirdly endearing yet also <laughs> spiteful. 
classic Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah classic exactly. siblings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that 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 kind of that he's already that, that way of thinking was mm. uh, adopted very early on in his life. So his school, his um, boarding school, Schleforter, was about four kilometers from his home in Nuremberg where he prepared for his university studies. And this was one of the best schools in Europe. It was really regimented. The days would start about 5 a.m. They'd finish about 7 or 8 p.m. And it would be constant um, philology. And he was dreadful at maths. And his maths teacher didn't actually want him to be able to graduate from high school. And there's a, an account of one of the other professors at the school saying, do you not want one of our greatest students to graduate? Like, look what he can do in all these other disciplines. So he has a very, he's not the most intelligent person to go through through the school on account that some of his other subject areas are weak, but he's very good at philology. Now, I just want to give one account, which is going to link into his atheism. Ollie says he was known as little pastor at school, but it was around the age of 18, in 1865, he starts to reject his faith in Christianity. He starts to reject his Lutheran faith. And he writes to his sister, Elizabeth, when he's 20. He says, hence the ways of men part. If you wish to strive for peace of soul and pleasure, then believe. If you wish to be a devotee of truth, then inquire. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. The school he went to was very strictly Lutheran and his upbringing was as such. So he definitely took a stand quite early on, or at least in his teenage years, where he was prepared to move against that, which is probably quite typical of a lot of teenagers these days. But mm. Nietzsche, I kind of feel like he, he's in a way, kind of one of those people that sets the standard for how people have kind of acted like after that fact. And I kind of lump in some of the other thinkers that we've talked about in the same sort of way. So people like uh, Sartre or Camus, I kind of feel like they share a same mm. spirit of that, yeah. of that time. You can see here as well, Nietzsche, you know, not just necessarily conforming to what everyone around him is doing. He's definitely forming his own identity of what he thinks is true. Um, and that's very apparent in his writing that he's just, he's not, he is influenced by people, of course, but he's writes in a very specific style with a very specific, unique kind of perspective. And just before we move on to the next bit, Jack, you've mentioned the idea of uh, ph philology there. And just for anybody who is unaware of exactly mm. what that discipline actually is, it's the, the, a study of classical texts and deep, like, deep dives into what were the intentions of the writers mm -hmm. and what were they trying to say? What's the historical context of, of the of the writing? He took a very deep interest in etymology. So that's like the roots of words. And you can actually see that coming through in a lot of his earlier books. He took a, a deep pride in, in what the words actually meant and analyzed and the, perhaps even the spiritual nature of certain words and how they can have such power in the public consciousness. And he took a deep interest in, uh, in the ancient Greeks which he he wrestles with quite a bit and perhaps we'll get onto this later but he, he, you know he he looks at people like socrates and plato and really wrestles with them like mm. he 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 wants to kind of say oh, you've got some great ideas but i think you're fundamentally wrong and he goes against a lot of the tradition and we western philosophical movement of his time and the same thing with the bible too so many of the reasons he becomes an atheist is because of this movement in europe at the time of you know, this, this philology, this understanding of classical texts, that includes the Bible. So, you know, we've got the invention of the Gutenberg Press. We've got, you know, uh, you know, Christianity isn't now just, you know, um, recitations in Latin at church on a Sunday. People can actually sit down with a text and dissect it and pick it apart. And, you know, there are some stuff in there that not everybody necessarily may agree with on paper. You know, Genesis 1 contradicts Genesis 2, for example, and all this sort of thing. Uh, you know, definitely influenced Nietzsche. Um, and he had that at school um, and obviously throughout his, his education at university too. Last little bit then before we get into his university life and his later writing career. I think it's just quite interesting that, so he graduates in 1864 and, and this is just the general practice that everybody had to do as they were leaving school, is that he had to thank his masters and state his gratitude to God and the king. Uh, can you just imagine Nietzsche having to like declare this this quote? And it's interesting whether or not actually at this point he still would have had held on to some sort of national pride or even maybe even some se sense of still believing in God. Mm. And then how very quickly over the next 10 years that would all just crumble and degrade into what he later became. Yeah, good. So after he finishes at this boarding school, he goes to the University of Bonn in 1864 as a theology and philology student. But then he moves exclusively to philology, he grows tired of this theology and starts entertaining ideas and philosophy as well. 
He moves to the University of Leipzig in 1865 and he establishes his academic reputation there, publishing essays on ancient Greek philosophers such as Simonides and Theognis as well. Um, it's an interesting part of his life because in this same year when he moves to the University of Leipzig, he stumbles upon a book in a bookshop. A second-hand bookshop. Ooh. It was it. It was, yeah. He, just, oh. he picked up an old copy of a very special book to him, uh, which is the, the World and Will, as, wait, sorry, The World as Will, <laughs> an idea by the German idealist philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. Ooh, who was Arthur Schopenhauer, Andrew? Well, uh, so Schopenhauer's dates are 1788 to 16, uh, sorry, 1860. And uh, Schopenhauer is now known as the kind of great pessimist. And he he was somebody who adopted a lot of what Immanuel Kant before him had, had talked about as, as far as how do we see the world? Mm. What's the difference between the like phenomena and the noumena? Well, the phenomena being what human beings experience the world as, and the noumena being this sort of sense that there are things outside of our experience that we can never quite understand fully. And Schopenhauer adopts this this type of language, but he also wants to go a bit further. And I think at this point, we can probably say that a lot, a lot of what he says is, is very much within the Buddhist tradition, and, and is certainly his approach to the biggest philosophical problem, I think, for Schopenhauer, which is that his understanding, and it kind of comes through the, the name of the book in which Nietzsche picks up, is, is that underneath all of the idea of the phenomena, the way we experience it, is a well, what can only be described by Schopenhauer as a will. Mm. And this will is just a striving it doesn't doesn't really desire anything as such. It just it moves everything in the universe, and that as any living being and and as human beings, we experience this that we just we have this striving to to survive and to live, and that all things are also striving. And um, but with this uh, this kind of desire to live also comes great suffering because we can't ever escape the the way in which we are we are living and uh so what's schopenhauer's response to this well he takes a somewhat well life denying view is what nietzsche will call it mm. where he says well if if we constantly are desiring and and striving for more and and but this creates this element of suffering then maybe the better approach here is to to adopt some form of asceticism where we say actually if we understand that we're all part of this striving will right. is to just adopt the sense that if we kind of let go of that stop desiring that we can kind of be a bit more at peace with what is and the reason why he's pessimistic is is because ultimately all, this is all life is schopenhauer denies god and th and therefore it's just this this constant need for for life and you just need to sort of sit back and and prevent yourself from the suffering that this is this is giving to you. Nietzsche adopts at least some of the language that Schopenhauer gives him. Um, anybody who knows anything about Nietzsche probably hears of the terms like the will to power. Mm. And so there's this definite sense of this idea of the will, but he, he fundamentally rejects a lot of what Schopenhauer has to offer. Mm. I think it's worth emphasizing the influence of Schopenhauer on Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche has dabbled in a little bit of philosophy before now, but this is where we go full-blown philosophy. This this work has a massive influence on his thinking, really inspires him. Um, and it's also the second story I think we've done where there's been a philosopher that's read a book. I think we had the same thing with Sartre, didn't we? Where he read some Hegel and was like, this changes everything. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like one of those moments, uh, Not maybe not to exaggerate it too much. But it is worth saying that a lot of the ideas that Schopenhauer grapples with, Nietzsche becomes very interested mm. in and really wants to grapple with them too. Um, and, you know, Schopenhauer, we'd love to do an episode on Schopenhauer in the future. Maybe we will. And I love the idea of studying anyone called the great pessimist. I mean, that's just surely the great one, one of the best titles ever because um, Nietzsche himself isn't necessarily too optimistic as well in certain yeah, regards. <laughs> yeah, just sort of kind of piggybacking on that point. It's interesting because Schopenhauer he gives Nietzsche the opportunity to look at the world in, in a particular way, which is when you look at it deep down, when you kind of just see it for what it is, there is there is kind of like, there's nothing uniquely special to it. And Schopenhauer looks at that and says, well, if, if all of these things, it's just will driving us to survive and that ultimately outside of that perspective of the human mind, there isn't really anything else there. You can see how that could get quite bleak. <laughs> like, like everything is just this one energy, and that my life, in the grand scheme of things, is somewhat completely meaningless. Um, maybe there there is ways in which you have to kind of adopt a particular mindset to overcome the problem, and Nietzsche recognizes that as well, right? Like, here's a world which is deeply full of suffering, and the one thing we're 
which we haven't perhaps even emphasized quite so much is that Nietzsche really did suffer from great physical illness yeah. and and he he had to kind of recognize this suffering throughout his entire life so for him the world was a lot of the time quite a lot of suffering and he yeah. had to he had to recognize what Schopenhauer had presented him and then come to terms with that and perhaps find a way to overcome it in a better more profound way at least for him as an individual mm. yeah and not even just physical suffering as well but also mental suffering you know Nietzsche ended up we'll get there in a moment but he did suffer from certain mental illnesses as well and spent the majority of his life on his own you know mm. in isolation so yeah you can definitely see the, the threads of this kind of uh, you know this, these threads of mental and physical suffering and isolation kind of feeding some of his ideas Good. And, you know, we mentioned his pass, uh, his nickname, the little pastor. This wasn't in terms of endearment by his peers. They were picking on him because he was so serious. He was bullied severely at school and he didn't have a wonderful family life. We mentioned that his father passed away. His little brother passed away. He was just surrounded by these women who were caring for him, but he didn't love them with his whole heart. In fact, a quote from him here, I confess that the deepest objection to the eternal recurrence, my real idea from the abyss, is always my mother and my sister. So when we talk about the eternal recurrence later, in summary, it's Nietzsche's hypothetical idea that you, know, you should live your life as if you'd live over it forever. He's saying there that I don't want to live my life forever because I don't want to be near my mother and sister. So his family life, his school life, these are things which uh, contain lots of suffering for him. Now, the great thing about Nietzsche is he's critical of everybody. So before we move forward, I just want to give this quote uh, about Schopenhauer, being as Andy's unpacked his ideas. So this is from 186 of Beyond Good and Evil. You can read it in his biography, and just out of curiosity, a pessimist who negates both God and the world, but stops before morality, who affirms morality and plays his flute, affirms laid nominum morality, excuse me, is this really a pessimist? So he's saying of Schopenhauer, you're not a pessimist enough. <laughs> like even Schopenhauer doesn't go far enough. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mentioned the idea of the Buddha, but uh, Nietzsche actually accuses Schopenhauer of still adopting Christian ethics. Mm. That he, in the face of this somewhat potential valueless world, he still ascribes to the Christian uh, ethics of his, of his time and of his society. And Nietzsche, I think, is, well, he grows to be quite resentful of Schopenhauer for that reason, I think. Uh, I think, Schop uh, sorry, I think Nietzsche often likes to accuse people of being cowards. Uh, and I think he would kind of say that. I think he's like, Schopenhauer, look at what you've found out. Like, look at the way you've seen the world. You like, you got almost to the end. Like, you, yeah. you were almost right. And then you, and then you backed out and you said, actually, no, th these values still hold. And Nietzsche wanted to tear that apart. Well, talking about backing out and being a coward, at the age of 21, the mustache <laughs> one visited Cologne, uh, where he was left by a good friend. Andrew, can you take us to 21-year-old Nietzsche's life in, in Cologne? What happened when he jumped in this taxi? So are you referring to the story of the brothel? <laughs> well, I didn't say it. I said a restaurant. <laughs> so uh, at least, I mean, you might want to say a little bit more after what I've, I say about this. You didn't get the restaurant joke. Because uh, that... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know certainly more about it than me. Uh, it's interesting. We, we haven't talked about Nietzsche's sex life. Um, <laughs> yeah. and Not normally the thing we start with. That is, yeah, that is interesting. Uh, and but oh, well, now we're going to, or actually we're not really, because what ended up happening is, is that he, <laughs> was that a burn? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think he was a, really a, a highly <laughs> sexual person, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, he's so he's he's taken. This is a small little anecdote, but mm. he's he's taken to a brothel and uh, as as a young man, and you would expect that he would probably dabble in uh, what brothels have to offer. What Mr. is a brothel, Andrew? Oh, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's a house for for women of the night, <laughs> for for prostitutes, Jack. <laughs> and, so I'm uh, assuming that Nietzsche slept with many prostitutes. You would think so, but guess what he did? What did he do? He sat down at a at a piano and played away through the night. What he there was? What, did they have pianos at brothels? Yeah, it's yeah. A, oh, right. classy brothel. When he just yeah. sat there and played piano, where other just, people yeah. kind of did their business. Yeah, I guess so. How that's an odd thought. It is? Well, he it, it didn't want to go. 
<laughs> so he got into the coach driver's, I uh, got into the taxi and he said, I'd like to go to a restaurant. But the coach driver thought he was too nervous. Oh, what, like winking, like, I want to go to a yeah, restaurant. Right, you know what I mean? A euphemism. For... So he takes him accidentally to the brothel, uh, Nietzsche and his friend, and then his friend leaves and Nietzsche stays and plays the piano. But when we're talking about Nietzsche's death and his insanity, which comes you know, mm. 10 years before mm -hmm. the end of his life, some Nietzsche scholars think that he picked up syphilis while he was there. Uh -huh. And that's why he went um, insane. See, that's or what happens when you don't clean those piano keys, you see. <laughs> yeah, are you accusing Nietzsche of having slept with one of those women? If you're going to a brothel this Christmas, make sure you <laughs> clean the piano keys. <laughs> <laughs> and wear protection. The... <laughs> don't go to a brothel, kids. <laughs> I didn't think we'd be saying that this yeah, episode. Yeah, well, there you go. Honest. But good advice, Andrew. Don't go to a brothel adults either, I guess. Would be... <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> without going into the sex you don't industry be a right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in 1867, Nietzsche was 23. And everyone in Prussia is required to do military service. At now, this I'm going to interrupt you now, Jack. I'm guessing that philosopher, philologist Nietzsche was a cracking soldier. Am I right? <laughs> well, he hurt himself getting onto a horse. So <laughs> it does sound quite bad. It though. does. We yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. He was, I mean, it's I horrific. Think he spent quite a long time in a, in a hospital afterwards, didn't he? Yeah, he had a severe chest injury. Mm. And they didn't think it was going to be able to operate it on. And a bone was literally sticking out of his chest Ooh. at one point. And this is quite far after the accident. I think it was salt water or something. He bathed it in and he had to take a, two baths every uh, a day, maybe, or a couple of days. So my, my facts Crikey. might not be wrong here. But he had to bathe it a lot and it was excruciatingly painful. This was a man going through lots of suffering again. Um, so he never returned to the military service after this. <laughs> what, is what a surprise. <laughs> It probably is some sort of self-infliction. Stop the war. <laughs> I need a salt bath. Pause for a moment. Yeah, he, he was. His whole life seems to you know, yeah. bodily ills throughout uh, much of his upbringing and, and adult life as well as we'd see. So he returns to the University of Leipzig the year uh, after joining the military and getting over his chest infection, his chest injury, and he meets the great composer Richard Wagner. Who was Richard Wagner? Well, he, at the time, he was one of the great uh, German musicians, and mm. uh, his name will will be remembered with some of the other greats, like uh, you know, Felix Mendelssohn. Yeah, I'm sure there's at least one other really great German musician around oh, the same period. Name? I don't know, some Mozart guy, but I don't. Be Beethoven was Beethoven. Beethoven German as well. Hmm. We should probably know that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he is. Why anyway, <laughs> Richard Wagner. Who was Richard yeah. Wagner? How influential was he? Why did Nietzsche, you know, f essentially go head over heels for this person? Well, it's it's interesting. They shared quite a a strong passion for Schopenhauer at the time. So they yeah. had they already had an intellectual uh, chemistry, as it were, to to start up a great friendship. And they and both him and Wagner also shared uh, a great interest in in the ancient Greeks and and of and particularly of Greek tragedy, which is something that Nietzsche will go on to write. And in in Nietzsche's first book, uh, the Birth of Tragedy, like Birth of Tragedy, yeah, right? birth, yeah, Birth of Tragedy. Um, 1872. He uh, he and, and Wagner actually discussed a lot of the ideas that would eventually end up in that book, mm. um, in in their sort of casual conversation, and and then eventually when he he wrote it and published it and gave a copy to Wagner, Wagner thought it was the most impressive book that he had ever read. I bet so, he did because it's very flattering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The whole the whole like last section of that book is sort of saying that Wagner is is the new embodiment of of the birth of this this greek tragedy that he, nietzsche thinks uh, is a a great example of how life should actually be approached uh, mm -hmm. and that when when things became too rationalized through through the likes of socrates and onwards uh, that the greeks actually lost their way a bit and wagner for him is at least an example of mm -hmm. moving back to the right way in, in which to pr approach art and and culture, uh, and so there's a lot to be said there. And and Wagner at the time, at least, uh, was very important to him. Worth emphasising, they were very close friends, influencing each other's work. So The Ring, uh, one of Wagner's most famous works, was influenced by Nietzsche, um, and Nietzsche was inspired by Wagner too. So they had a very close friendship. Um, worth saying at this point as well that obviously Wagner is an anti-Semite um, and obviously we kind of know what happens with anti-Semitism in Germany um, you know, with the rise of the Nazi party and that was actually one of the main reasons that Wagner and Nietzsche eventually fell out um, with mm. kind of Wagner's kind of 
becoming more and more, um, you know, uh, indoctrinated into the idea of the Aryan supremacy um, and that sort of thing didn't really kind of sit too well with Nietzsche. And they ended up actually becoming quite uh, unfriendly and then eventually not talking at all, really. Um, so they had quite an intense friendship um, and creative period. But then after that, they kind of, you know, fell out. Yeah, good. Because we won't be talking about The Birth of Tragedy, his uh, book from 1872, in any detail, really. It's just worth saying on this point of Wagner that there was these, these two ideas, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. And these terms just refer to, so the Apollonian just means uh, the rational, ordered, self-disciplined aspect of human nature. And the Dionysians, that sensual, spontaneous and emotional aspect of our nature. And Nietzsche thought the great thing about Greek tragedy was it embodied these two things. And it had been dead since, you know, he crushes Socrates in his writings for being someone who goes to Apollonian. He thinks the rationalism of Europe has crushed great tragedies and great music as well. So he thinks Wagner has finally encouraged compass these two things again in his book, The Birth of Tragedy. Although Wagner loved it, everybody else hated it. <laughs> like it was it was crushed by his peers in the philology world. Yeah, so I think the the academic circles trashed it. Um, but Nietzsche as as somebody who would later go on to write more books in, in sort of very interesting styles. Uh, I think pe people who were poets and people who were just general writers still took the book for what it was and i think there was there was a community of people that enjoyed it uh, but yeah as far as his standing as a top academic i think from that moment uh, he realized that he, he that was not his place and and i think quite rightly um, because the whole book is notorious for not like footnoting anything so he makes quite broad sweeping claims about the greeks and don't get me wrong he obviously knew his stuff to a point but i think they wanted to see it backed up with a little bit more historical accuracies which is not what he has to offer it's kind of uh, a first in look i mean this is the way and least i've i've been reading around nietzsche and in that book in particular is that it's it's kind of a a precursor for the kind of um Freudian psychoanalytic uh, analytical view on on culture mm. where he just analyzes so as you said like the difference between the uh, Dionysian and the Apollonian that is very psychoanalytic it's sort of saying here are these two ways of thinking and being and that these myths tell us something deep about us as human beings and and which myths are actually the most powerful and moving for us uh, and so he's certainly more interested than that than necessarily the absolute facts of the matter um, so it really depends on what you're looking for in, in a writer so let's wrap up his university to career so like we said his peers around the academic world uh, the majority of them gave unflattering reviews of the birth of the tragedy but he remained respected enough to retain his uh, professorship at basil but we should have mentioned as well that as a professor at basil he was only 24 years old and he was the youngest person ever to be offered the chair of classical philology uh, that shouldn't be understated. At this point, yes, he has a troubled uh, boarding school experience, but he's a genius in the philology world. I think he, of a friend of a friend, he manages to get himself this chair. Um, you know, it's not exactly something which was done at the time. So he, his health starts to deteriorate. He's got migraines, problems with his eyesight, he's vomiting, and he starts to resent his teaching as well. And he's age 34 in 1879. He leaves his profession and he gets a small pension. And so he becomes very much a nomad for the rest of his life. He, he's just wandering from European city to European city, occasionally going back home to spend time with his mother and his sister. But he's just traveling around and writing for the yeah. rest of his life. You can kind of see him almost in a kind of like a, a, a kind of almost like a prophet sense. Apart from the fact instead of teaching, he's just writing. He's traveling around, um, getting lots of different experiences um, and, and just feverishly writing he writes mm. so much in a short period of time all the major books that that Nietzsche you know writes were written in a really I think they're all written within like a 10 year period yeah, so it's he, like five or six books he leaves 1879 and then 81 he publishes Daybreak 82 The Gay Science Thus Spoke Verathustra in 83 our topic for part two Beyond Good and Evil 86 Genealogy Models 87 in 88 he publishes The Case of Wagner Twilight of the Idols The Antichrist Eke Homo and Nietzsche Contra Wagner like wow like he public that's i can't count them off that's i'm not going to count them on my a phone lot. that won't make it's, for it's good it's entertainment a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get them through all these <laughs> okay one two three. <laughs> yeah i think you used the word genius earlier i think mm. whether you think you agree with the 
philosophy of Nietzsche or not, and whatever you think about him, he was most certainly an incredibly intelligent man um, and clearly had a lot of ideas in his head that he really wanted to pour onto the paper, um, which he did. You know, we have a lot of his work and even a lot of his unpublished work as well. Like he wrote, you know, pages and pages of notes you know, some of his work was uh, published after he died as well. Mm. And there still is stuff that's even not been published yet because there was he just wrote and wrote and wrote. Yeah, such a the wealth of reading there and hence why we just focus on his biography, Thus Spoke and Beyond Good and Evil. Um, so we should emphasize that he is a nomad in the complete sense. He's not a citizen of Prussia anymore because the University of Basel asked him to recant his citizenship so he wasn't called up for another embarrassing military service. They didn't want him to disappear again for a year. They were paying him to teach there. And then he never bothered getting Swiss citizenship. So he's a citizen of no country. He's literally a nomad in the complete sense of the term. Should we talk about his relationship with women a little bit more here and his relationship with Lou von Salmon? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, uh, my my knowledge of this is somewhat limited, but just just based on my, the cursory glance that I was looking, it's quite an interesting one because Nietzsche, along with I guess a lot of the people that we look at, lived quite a solitary life, mm -hmm. uh, and and therefore, like when people ask, like, well, you know, what was his relationships like? I think this one might might give a hint as to why maybe he he didn't find any more romantic success, or if, even if he ever wanted to, um, because he had this deep. Uh, sort of close friendship with these two people and and they were friends and he he decided that with Lou that he wanted to take it to the next step and he was going well he did he tried to propose and then he was told that actually no this wasn't going to happen it wasn't going to work only for him to find out that she was actually with this other guy and that he was left completely devastated and that uh, at no point on from that point I, as, as far as I'm aware did he have any sort of close romantic relationship with another Woman. Have you heard how he asked us to, to marry him? No, how, so, how so exactly? It's, it's how Lou, he, the woman he, he falls in love with, Paul yeah. as well, Paul Ray. And they're in kind of like a three way triangle platonic relationship, like the three of us. But then let's say I fall in love with Ollie and you fall in love with Ollie. Yeah. And my way of asking Ollie to marry me is to ask you to ask Ollie for oh, Of course, me. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's ah. uh, what could go wrong. I mean, Lou, Lou von Simone, she goes on, we've mentioned Freud. She actually goes on to work with Freud in Berlin later in her life. Yeah. She's massively influential. And he's gone long walks talking about psychology and philology. Nietzsche kisses this woman, he's in love with her. And But no, she runs away uh, with Paul Ree and a quote from a letter to his friend, friend Franz Overbeck here. Um, after this happened, Nietzsche said, tonight I will take so much opium that I will lose all reason. He's deeply cut up by this whole yeah. state of affairs. Well, she also wrote a study of him as well in 1894. So not only is, you know, he been rejected by this woman, but also somewhat being treated like some kind of psychoanalytical study lab rat. A good candidate. Situate, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and the, the thing is, I guess Nietzsche did that to a lot to other people yes. as well. Yeah. So for him to be too critical of people writing about his life and his motivations would be somewhat yeah. uh, a bit harsh. He's dead though. by this point. Well. <laughs> it's a bit well, harsh, of course, though. but like, yeah, sure. Someone they say oh, no, no, he's not. Then. He's not dead. 1894. Did you Just, say? He oh, yeah, sorry, he's not. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's probably insane by now. He yeah. definitely is. Yeah. Should we get onto his insanity? <laughs> he definitely is insane by now. So in 1889, he experienced a mental breakdown, which left him mentally disabled for the rest of his life. This is the death of Nietzsche's mind, his first death. It's coincidentally, his little brother Joseph died many years ago before, very much this, pretty much the same date. So he was walking down a street and a coachman was whipping a horse, the story goes. And Nietzsche runs up to the horse and throws his arms around his neck and just collapses in the middle of the plaza. And he never returns to full sanity. After a brief stay in hospital, his mother takes care of him. And then after his mother passes away, his sister Elizabeth looks after him. So he lives with Elizabeth from 1890 all the way up to 1900. And he has these 10 years of just essentially being in complete mental paralysis. And very occasionally he'll uh, say something. I used to write great books, didn't I? And, but most of the time he would just sit there. He was, he was completely in a vegetative state. He doesn't write anything. He's incapable of doing anything. I think Elizabeth showboats people round, they bring around so they can see him, but he doesn't talk, he doesn't do anything, he just sits there. And this is where we get to a bit of weird stuff about Nietzsche. So Nietzsche's now insane, to all intents and purposes, the Nietzsche that we know is gone. Um, 
And this is where his sister kind of has uh, authority over his work. So she kind of um, inherits. I can't remember if it's it's left to her or if she kind of takes it, but she inherits mm. the, his his name um, and you know the, the rights to his work, which means that she now has access to all of his notes, um, obviously all of his 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 books. Um, and this is where because we haven't quite mentioned it yet, but Nietzsche's sister was married to um, a very famous anti-Semite as well. So mm. we've got this kind of anti-Semitic point coming up and um one of Nietzsche's most famous works is called The Will to Power which was published after his death which is a, a compilation of some of his notes that was very strongly edited by his sister um with very strong anti-semitic overtones in it which is quite interesting because a lot of his work is very anti anti-semitic um, very anti-nationalist um but you know we've got if you, we think of the you know the social situation in germany at the time we've got you know the the rise of nazism in the early 19th century we've got hitler um and hitler was very influenced by a lot of nietzsche's work specifically the will to power mm. um and i think a lot of 20th century philosophers have been quite critical of nietzsche because of that you know people didn't study him at all because you know he's just some crazy nazi philosopher um, which is a real shame actually that you know after he's effectively gone his his work is changed and altered by other people and kind of twisted um to suit the political needs of, of others um because obviously the nazis did horrendous things and even someone like hitler th you know walking around thinking that he is some kind of ubermensch some kind of superman um inspired by uh inspired by someone who didn't even tend that to be the case is, you know, it's, quite, it's a very sad into his story, I guess, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and what I also find deeply distressing for Nietzsche himself is that it, so much of his work was about being an iconoclast, somebody who would look at the sort of values of a particular society and like poke holes in them, tear them down, particularly the, the grand things like Christianity. And that also, and we'll shortly be getting into this, but in the spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra, the character, makes a very strong emphasis on the fact that he does not wish to be a prophet like Jesus or somebody else of that that kin, where where like he is to be followed to the word, and that you follow, like you basically follow his philosophy as a self help book uh, that tells you how to act. This is something in which you must try and find yourself. And unfortunately, his sister turned Nietzsche into the very thing that he wished not to be, and by allowing other people to adopt it in this fashion, uh, I, I think he would be deeply appalled with how his name was translated mm. uh, in in the, the sort of short period after his death. Lots of work has then since been done and kind of, and his 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 word and his, his name has been recovered somewhat. But as you've just said there, I think there are still communities of people who hear the name Nietzsche and will probably just disregard most of what there has to be on offer. Yeah, it should be said as well and emphasized that this uh, will to power is book post after his death. Uh, there's a great uh, Nietzschean scholar, Mazzino Montanari, who said, literally, I quote him, it's a forgery. This isn't Nietzsche's work. Mm. This is his sister using her, her anti-Semitic husband and her anti-Semitism herself and her support for the Nazi regime is you know, motivating her to adapt Nietzsche's work to her own ends. And it's incredible that Nietzsche actually, uh, the Nietzsche archive is visited by Hitler numerous times throughout the Nazi party's um, time after 1933 in power in, in Germany. And there's photographs of his sister meeting Hitler outside the archives, I believe it's seven times that he is there overall. But it's afterwards, after the Second World War, this they use uh, untermentioned uh, and Ubermensch, the Nazis, as part of their propaganda. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of, when you're reading through Beyond Good and Evil and, and The Spoke Zarathustra, you know, it's not hard to see how easy it was for her to do this, though, because Nietzsche doesn't really give a positive aspect to his theory. There's a looseness in, you know, what he wants us to do. So she's managed to take those, thread them together for her own agenda. Yeah, I mean, a lot of Nietzsche's work is down to interpretation. You know, is he being ironic? Is he saying, no, this is the actual truth? And I guess the problem with that, if you're not direct enough, is that if people misinterpret your work or interpret in a way which you haven't thought of, then it can be somewhat dangerous, can't it? I mean, you know, with the ultimate example of the Nazis there. So, you know, that's a that's a really good example of, you know, people have interpreted Nietzsche in so many different ways over so many years. Mm. And here we have like almost the worst <laughs> interpretation um, you could possibly imagine. Um, you could say the looseness of Nietzsche's philosophy is its undoing. 
Oh, you could say that. I don't think they're my words. I read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this R.J. Hollingdale, most of my translations are from him. He was responsible for kind of re, um, you know, what am I saying? Rehabilitating Nietzsche's w- reputation after World War II. Just going to give a final quote on this anti-Semitism from Beyond Good and Evil 251. But the Jews are without a doubt the strongest, purest, and most tenacious race living in Europe today. He he praises the Jews as fighting against, um, you know, as a, a, an example of someone that does this slave revolt, which we'll talk about. The strength of the Jews he praises throughout all of his work, actually. I'm going to give one more quote, which I've found it, and then we can move on. Where am I? Well, well as you're finding the quote as well. He was more critical of German nationalism than yeah. Jewish. Yeah, Massively. I just wanted to make a point of, well, so that as well as other things, in that in some of his writings, there are moments in which he is critical of the Jews. But in the same way, he was also praising of the Jews as well as a collective. Uh, and, and therefore, it's to be careful with anybody who writes like Nietzsche does. Nietzsche was critical and praiseful of a whole bunch of different groups of people. And that, you know, when he criticizes Christians, he also praises certain Christians. Uh, and, and, and on that point, he was quite praising of Jesus himself, not of Christians in, in the herd-like manner. But, you know, he has a respect for certain groups of people. And and we already mentioned Wagner, but he obviously had great respect for him in certain cases and detested him in others. Yeah. I think he's just a very like he's not a black and white thinker in that sense. So when you can find examples of potentially anti-Semitic wording in Nietzsche, doesn't mean that he himself was an anti-Semite. No, definitely. I don't think personally he is. And he kind of sees this coming from Elizabeth as well. Being as it's Christmas, I'm going to give a quotation from his letter to his sister on Christmas Day in 1887. You have committed one of the greatest stupidities for yourself and for me. Your association with an anti-Semitic chief expresses a foreignness to my whole way of life, which fills me again and again with ear or melancholy. It is a matter of honour for me to be absolutely clean and univocal in relation to anti-Semitism, namely opposed to it, as I am in my writings. It arouses mistrust against my character, as if publicly I condemn something which I favoured secretly, and that I am unable to do anything against it, that the name of Zarathustra is used in every anti-Semitic correspondence sheet, has almost made me sick several times. It's pretty explicit there, isn't it? I don't know. That's open for interpretation, Jim. <laughs> I think you missed the bit at the end where it says, Merry Christmas, Llama. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Unfaithful Llama this time. <laughs> so in 1900, nearing his 56th birthday, Nietzsche passes away. Um, what am I going to say after that? The end. See ya! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So he passes away in 1900 after being in a state of mental and physical paralysis for the last 10 years, just before his 56th birthday. Just before we move on to part two and actually start unpacking and looking at his actual works, starting with Thus Spoke Zarathustra, I want to emphasize that you know, for Nietzsche, his philosophy is very personal to him and he writes with his whole heart. And it's easy to see, and this will come through, I want to mention it now, before we get to part four and ages into the future, three weeks in the future, where we're looking at the personal aspect of his philosophy. His life isn't a success story. It's a sad story of a lot of misery and failure. And he has lots of embarrassing experiences and lots of humiliating experiences. Um, like we've mentioned, his grievances with his family, his bullying as a school child, the fact that his first book was so un- wasn't well received by his peers. And even then, his greatest book, what he says, The Spoke Zarathustra, it's, it's his favorite uh, work of his. And he will give a quote later on as to, you know, in Eke Homer, him saying this. The first three parts only sold about 60 copies each. And the fourth part was just distributed to a few friends. Like he wasn't best selling. He wasn't well read. He wasn't well received even by the people, let alone his academic peers. And this will come through when we're looking at solitude, the idea of, ah, you need to get away from the masses. They're all wrong and I'm right type thing. Yeah, his life was full of suffering in solitude. And those who did read him, um, you know, I'm going to give a quote from his his book, Eke Homo, under the section, Why I Write Such Good Books. He says, uh, a monster of courage, curiosity, who is supple, clever, cautious, a born adventurer and discoverer. That's the type of person that can read his book. And they just weren't around, thinks Nietzsche at his time. I think it's interesting as well that he dies in 1900 and 
you know, the dawn of the 20th century. And it's very rarely are you going to find a philosopher like Nietzsche, which has what I'm going to call crossover appeal. So he appeals so much and influenced so many artists, musicians. It, he wasn't a, a philosopher's philosopher, in inverted commas. I, I kind of feel like the people that were massively influenced by him, it was much later. And I think it was more, there's definitely a strong element to the arts. And, you know, you can almost look at his work as almost having like poetic points. You know, he, he kind of references that, you know, he really likes Homer and Homer's way of doing things. And he's kind of like a more of like a modern version of like a, like some kind of griot or some kind of Sufi or some kind of like, although he wasn't a prophet in the inverted commas, that he kind of had a more poetic uh, kind of uh, approach, which lots of people responded very positively to after he died. And his ideas are still very much um, out there if you're looking for them. You mm. know? And if you look into, you know, books and uh, movies and TV and film, it'd be, you don't have to dig too deep to find a bit of Nietzsche. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, on, on, on that matter, I mean, we mentioned the fact that he was sort of a precursor for people like Freud, yeah. but it really goes understated he he really was a huge influence on freud and then as an extension people like jung he was mm -hmm. a, a great influence on sartre and and on uh on camus because of the ideas that were very popular with them mm -hmm. with the with the kind of atheistic god is dead uh, and how to approach that dilemma uh, where they were deeply in, uh influenced and then the, you could go even further than that and look at people like Foucault or Derrida. Like there, there is not much philosophy that has happened since Nietzsche that where somebody hasn't at least commented yeah. on Nietzsche and what he had to say, um, even if it is an outright rejection of Nietzsche. Mm. They, they, they have to like he almost demands to be heard in some capacity. Well, if he, Freud, he said, "I'm going to stop reading Nietzsche in fear that he wouldn't have anything else to say." Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the quote goes. Just before we look at the first thing we're going to look at in part two is this idea of the death of God. And just to talk about his influence very briefly here, when we spoke to Rebecca Goldstein, me and Ollie, in our interview with her, it's this idea that William Lane Craig and this debate between the atheists and the theists now is if God is dead, you know, i.e. if you're not having God in your moral system, what's the point? And that's kind of where we're going to be looking at throughout this whole episode is with the rise of secularism, what Nietzsche predicts is what we're kind of living in now in many ways. God's not the focal point anymore. Maybe the state is or some kind of secular belief system. And what's that going to look like in the future? Should we play a game of Mystery Philosopher? The Mystery Philosopher. Let's do it. And I hope this time it isn't some sort of trick, trick yes. that makes me think that it's some philosopher only to turn out to be studio headphones. <laughs> The Mystery Philosopher. I'm ready. Born ready. Um, so this was sent to me. Um, I don't know who... Sent to you? Yeah, it was sent to me via email. Um, cool. That's not suspicious That's not true. I'm just trying to give you some kind of okay. mystery story to make story it sound it. more mis mis Are you ready? mysterious. Yep. As consciousnesses or as beings for themselves, we have a, like a particular mode of thinking. It's through the process of negation. There is a difference between you and the other things. I mean, that sounds like me. Who's <laughs> <laughs> your guess going to be? Me. And Ollie? I'm going to go with someone who's talking really quick. Who mm. talks quick? I'm going to go with you, actually. I'm going to go with really? Jack. Yeah. Well, for the first time, Andrew has guessed the mystery <laughs> philosopher. Well done, Andrew. It wow. was you. Well done, there you me. go. That was, that was easy. For a bonus point, can you <laughs> tell me what episode it was from? I mean, presumably that was the last episode, so Simone de Beauvoir. <laughs> <laughs> Man, Jack had to really dig deep to find that quote. <laughs> yeah, you're being lazy with the mystery well, philosophy. I'm going to have to prepare a new one for next week. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't think of the possibility of you guessing the first time. Happy New Year to you both in advance for two days after tomorrow. What are you both going to be doing for New Year's Eve? Uh, so I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going up to a mountain. I'm going to be staying there for 10 years <laughs> to isolate myself before <laughs> turning up in the t nearby town in, in in the future to proclaim my truths. I'm going to try and climb a horse. I hope it goes well. <laughs> I'm going to do some tightrope walking. <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> right, that, I mean, some of that was quite good. It's always hard to tell. It was, uh, like, there were moments. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been funny. Let's, Let's get some food. <laughs> I feel like I've just gone to
thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)